Handheld radios are kind of like uh, holding a microwave to your face, <laughs> right? <laughs> Juicing up, you could pop some popcorn. I know there's been some myths about that, but... <laughs> um, there's actually a warning in these manuals that you have to hold them at least an inch from your face because that antenna is broadcasting like five watts of power. Wow. Welcome to Waiver Watch episode 33 on June 28th, 2020. We are 107 Waivers, and each week we bring to you some of the most interesting waivers granted by the FAA in the weeks prior. And I guess this week was not that impressive, was it, Jakey? <laughs> no. We are, back. <laughs> no. we are back to our April levels, unfortunately. That is not good. So... We'll wrap up a quick agenda here so you guys know what is coming at you. So weekly totals, we'll hit you with that. A telecom company waiver, 107.51 high altitude. And VHF handheld radios, which frequency should you be monitoring when you are operating a UAS? If you happen to be operating, or excuse me, if you happen to be using a VHF radio while operating. That's right. <laughs> Whoa kind of ruined that agenda for the day but you got the <laughs> you got the gist of it <laughs> all right um let's do some perfect. totals absolutely there's jump into many. it jakey there's hit not us many with, of them hit us with the weekly waiver totals <laughs> got it. you gotta get that in <laughs> uh, yeah that's right uh, all right so we got 25 waivers uh we haven't seen that that few approved since like mid-april unfortunately so Mm -hmm. Had a couple good weeks. It was like, oh, maybe we're climbing out of it. But just like those COVID cases coming back, we are we're back in the in the uh, dumps. I don't know. That's that's a strong <laughs> word. We're not back in the dumps. But anyways, yeah. twenty five. Yeah. So we had twenty four night waivers and the one high altitude, which Brent mentioned, and we're gonna cover. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, let's, California well, took home a bunch, but other than that's yeah. I was gonna say, let's talk about that map. It just the map looks less than impressive this week. Yeah. It's not the the approvals are not spread out across the U.S. like they have been. Uh, yeah. Still, one thing is for certain: uh, Montana is still <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna well, throw a party when Montana, gonna... Wyoming, or South Dakota <laughs> gets a waiver. <laughs> right. Those right. three. Uh, but uh, so. pretty pretty strong, you know, showing by the Great Lakes region. I guess they they had a yeah. couple around there, and uh, they're getting after it. You know, so. the Midwest, Kansas, and Nebraska had some in there. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, just low numbers. So for sure. So do you want to just jump right into LS Telecom Inks? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, you know what I'm just noticing too. Like, uh, check out, and this actually might. Um, this is something I just noticed. Okay, the waiver number, 00474. It's an it's early one. It's a really old one. Mm -hmm. um, how long have we been in the queue for ours? <laughs> Over three months. So actually, maybe it's just maybe the, the team is a lot smaller that reviews uh, high altitudes. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think there is. There's like a high alt. There's a... Because remember, this is the air traffic organization approving these, not flight standards. So mm -hmm. I think there's probably just like a uh, ATO team that meets like once a month, maybe, <laughs> and just like approves two or three of them, you know, when yeah. they do their safety risk analysis. So yeah, this number yeah. was back in January, probably for sure, though. Right. At least right. that they started the application. So. Yeah, they might not submit it exactly in January, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, but they th were they were thinking about it back then. Yep. <laughs> so, well, so, perfect. Why don't give us a little bit of details uh, on this? It is pretty high, so very high. hit us with the details. Yeah. So, this is not LS Telecom's first high altitude. They got one maybe two months ago. I uh, forget, but they they have received a high altitude before, and they they typically do do like very high altitudes. I remember their first one was high as well, but this one is up to 2,133 feet AGL, mm -hmm. which is crazy. That's like a third of a mile <laughs> just <laughs> up. <laughs> so think about that. But, uh, yeah, the, the area is in, uh, Sioux, just North of Sioux city, Iowa. It is a, um, what appears to be 
just a tower inspection, like some really tall towers. There's some 2,000 foot tall mm -hmm. TV towers at this area. And so, Brent, why in the world would you get a waiver for this if you could just do it? If you're flying near a tower, I mean, like, can't you do that already under 107.51? Yeah, so you can. However, they're asking for a lot bigger radius around this tower. And it might come out to, we're making a few assumptions here, but it might come out to the fact that the guy wires for this tower are stretching out so far. Um, so the operating area that they're actually asking for is 0.81 nautical mile radius at or below uh, 2,133 feet. So, which is also very specific, right? 33 feet for some yeah. reason. Um, so they know exactly, they know exactly what they want and they requested that. So according to, you know, regular part 107 rules unwavered, you can fly 400 feet above that structure. You just have to remain within 400 feet of the center point of that, the highest object. So technically you can fly quite a bit higher than what they're requesting, but it's coming down to the fact that they wanted to fly outside of these, uh, outside that 400 foot radius. So they mm -hmm. have a point eight one nautical miles, which is quite a distance as well, which kind of like, mm -hmm. think about this, Jakey, we, we know like they're going to ask the question, like, how do you maintain visual line of sight? Cause this is not a visual line of sight waved, uh, operation. Yeah. So. I know <laughs> it, it's 2000. What, like what drone are they using? Yeah. It's 2000 feet in the air. Like I know that when I'm like running the Phantom four or the Mavic, like 2,500 is like kind of like my limit. Um, and it really depends on sky conditions on how much farther you can fly that. So they are pushing the edge of visual line of sight if they're using a smaller drone. So maybe they're using an M 600 or yeah. M 210, or maybe they have an M 300. Yeah. But when the application went in, if it went in January, they didn't have the M300. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, just, I mean, maybe so like probably just strategies, right. Or, or how can this be done safely? So obviously mm -hmm. when there's these huge towers, that's going to deter manned aircraft from being nearby. So the, the, you get mm -hmm. kind of this infrastructure shadowing, uh, type of operation, which helps. The mm -hmm. operations are also in a very rural area, so there's pretty low risk of um, coming down on somebody. I'm sure they have to still monitor the area, but it's mm -hmm. very rural. Um, but just because you get approved for point A doesn't mean you're necessarily flying that far away. Um, so maybe they're just standing like at the bottom of the tower and they're kind of flying straight up and uh, mm -hmm. very minimal lateral movements, maybe just a small orbit, stuff like that. But um, you know, they, they right. could be flying at very short distances, just very high is, mm -hmm. is kind of the point. So it's hard to know. Right. Right. But still so, super tall. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> tall tower. Like <laughs> that is, yeah. You know, very tall. Uh, speaking of tall towers, there is a very tall tower in North Dakota as well. Mm -hmm. uh, taller than this. Are you going to Sky Vector right now, now to I go find look, it? Look, actually, because I'm actually pretty <laughs> sure it's taller. It, it, I think at one point it was the tallest freestanding tower in North America, but that may not be true anymore. But looking at it, yeah, it's there's a 2,060 foot tower. Yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe we should get those guys up here to do another inspection, right? That thing, it's crazy right. when you look at it. It's like, man. And uh, so just think about this too. Like, uh, they would have like a tower climber go up that. Can you imagine climbing 2,000 feet straight up into the air? Yeah. Like a drone does seem like a really good idea. If like, yeah. if you're hands off on this tower, like if you're not, if you're only doing visual inspections, bringing your GoPro, bringing your cameras uh, to document the condition of the tower, you know, why not try to do that with a drone instead of risking someone climbing up there? Unless you have to physically touch or work on the tower, uh, you shouldn't ever climb that high uh, if you have yeah. another tool in the toolbox, right? Um, yeah. Certain the tower climber would uh, also appreciate being at the bottom and flying a drone up and, you know, mm -hmm. it's not the, yeah, it's a good, it's a good alternative uh, inspection method. So, yeah. All right. So should we get into like the good, good stuff? The, the featured event. 
the yeah. featured event. We saved the best for last. You know, shame on us, right? We were making you watch the YouTube video all the way to the end. We should have talked about this first. But uh, yeah, we're going to key. Uh, we'll have the segments where you can just jump right to this. So, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, VHF handheld radios, which frequency should you monitor? Um, Jakey, why don't you tell us why we're talking about this? We had, you know, fill us in. Yeah, so, so we had a uh, subscriber this week uh, essentially ask us this question. It was like, hey, I'm, I have this handheld radio, the, uh, and it's like, how do I know what frequency to tune it to? You know, how do I use this? I want to be a better drone pilot. I want to have better situational awareness. Mm-hmm. And this is like, great question. And actually, the answer is really not simple. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, okay, you know, why don't we, since there's only 25 waivers approved this week, right? Like, why don't we dive into it and kind of, mm-hmm describe some of the challenges, maybe give some examples here on um, mm-hmm. some some locations and kind of what we think of when we're looking for frequencies, so. Right, right. So, and so you said it's not that simple, right? Well, that kind of depends, right? Because if we're out here in North Dakota, <laughs> it may be simple. However, the, the subscriber is actually operating in LA. Mm-hmm. So it is not simple <laughs> in yeah. LA. Grand Forks, North Dakota, eh, pretty simple. You do have a flight school here, but uh, it's fairly fairly routine on what they are doing. Very predictable. Um, so, yeah, let's deep dive into this, Jakey, and kick it off. Yeah, so first, so first, just some basic VHF handheld kind of, there's actually some legal things here, and then just uh, cautions, basic practices. So mm-hmm. everybody should know that VHF handheld radios you you're prohibited from actually broadcasting with them on the ground unless you have a ground station license so the essentially what comes down to is the vhf band that aviation uses it's approved for aviation services relating to flight safety Um, air stations are approved for use Uh, so like literally what's in the aircraft when when a pilot keys a mic in an aircraft that's an approved use uh, there are some approved uses for ground as well, such as air traffic control towers and uh, maybe like uh, mechanic um, shops that have to do like uh, radio functional checks. Um, so there are some kind of approved uses, but a drone pilot using a handheld radio kind of moving around a bunch is actually not an approved use unless mm-hmm. you have a license. So just keep that in mind throughout all this. Um, a lot of people do it. It's not like the FCC is uh, enforcing it, but it is prohibited. Um, right. And some but, of the radios actually have a, a warning in the manual on it. So. And I would say if if you know if a bunch of drone pilots started transmitting on VHF radios, certainly the FCC would start cracking down. Yeah. Um, it's not a problem because people respect the use of the radio. So at the end of the day, right, plain and simple, don't use your radio to transmit, only use it to monitor. Certainly if there's an emergency, uh, I think rules can be broken and bent uh, because, you know, you have the ability to transmit, but Mm -hmm. at all costs, do not transmit. Do not say, hey, this is where I'm at. It's your responsibility to see and avoid all manned aircraft. And to do that, you do not need to talk to them. You just need to be aware and cognizant of how you're operating. So, yep. Do you want to talk about the, yeah, <laughs> the you next get the best part. practices, Ray, I mean, which is great. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so really, we're we're using it for situational awareness. We're listening. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe that tells us where manned aircraft are, and it helps us avoid them, which is great. So that's a great use of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, this example, right? So um, basically, th- this is uh, an area just south of UCLA. So you'll have to go to our blog post. We do have some pictures and graphics of this. Uh, But it's just south of UCLA. And if you look at the building, kind of actually the first interesting thing is it does look like there's a lot of helipads there, right? Right. And you go, oh my gosh, like there's going to be helicopter traffic. Um, And so it's good. Um, Yeah, I want to be aware of that and use this radio and so on. But... Uh, are these actual active helipads? Kind of an interesting thing, right, Brent? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so apparently there's a there's a statute in LA 
uh, that any building over 75 feet had to have a essentially like an emergency landing zone on it for helicopters. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at this picture, there's there's a helipad almost on like 50% of the buildings in this <laughs> picture. And there's like right. a little number on them. But what does that number stand for, Brent? Yeah, so the number is uh, just basically the weight capacity uh, in the thousands. So if you see a 10, that means 10,000 pounds can land on that helipad. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's striking when you look at this picture, like, oh my gosh, like... <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of corporate executives flying into these buildings, but um, there's that. Uh, did we link that article, the LA Times article in the, um, in the blog? I think so. Yep. Okay. But so, out. yeah, what was the, what was the point? Why? Why was this an ordinance? You know? Yeah. So there was like an accident in Brazil, I think, or somewhere in the world um, back in like the 70s where um, they, they tried to basically like airlift uh people in this building from the top due to the mm -hmm. fire. And so that kind of spurred this, uh, you know, motion for the city to um, implement an, an emergency, you know, escape essentially mm -hmm. from a fire from tall buildings. So if there was a fire on lower floors, people could actually go up, a helicopter could land and airlift people out rapidly. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of the impetus of it, but they actually repealed it about six years ago now so basically fire protection got better uh mm -hmm. it was maybe kind of dangerous anyways for a helicopter to be landing on a building on fire so they they got rid okay. of that statue but there's obviously still buildings that were built that way mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so that's why that's why it's there but anyways so they're not maybe real active helipads uh, but it, it kind of just spurred this thought like man i, I really should be listening to helicopter traffic so mm -hmm. Where can we find information on what frequency to listen to if you actually do want to? So, yeah, for sure. Like one of the easiest uh, locations, and I'm sure a lot of people already use it, is Sky Vector. So when you navigate to Sky Vector, you can see all the frequencies that you would want to tune into. But maybe, you know, kind of deciphering down like, OK, uh, how do I know exactly for sure? So there is additional charts. Um, and one of the nice things too, you can, if you zoom into like the LA area, there is an LA West uh, heli chart that you can look at that will give you some of this information. Also at the very top left of Sky Vector, there is a globe that says charts underneath it. And you can also click and find the charts there. Mm -hmm. So these are high detailed maps of the area. And some of them even include like small drawings of what are some visually identifiable buildings. Um, I'm just like looking south here, like mm -hmm. little company of Mary hospital. It's like drawn, like what it actually looks like. So very good visual indicators. Um, there's another tower, a like Getty center, uh, mm -hmm. hotel, uh, near that. So anyway, so the information is laid out on these charts and, uh, Jiggy, if you want to keep going in and describing about, I'm just kind of looking at the arrows. Like, yeah. what, do, what do I start to look at when I deep dive into this chart now? How do I know which frequency to pick? Yeah. So, so this is kind of an example of like off airport, right? So um, when you zoom into Sky Vector, it, it won't be obvious like where you are actually flying because, you know, helicopters don't care about street addresses and all that. So, <laughs> you know, once you find your spot, maybe via a lat long or mm -hmm. um, some other references, um, in this particular example, there are no like obvious frequencies um, since it's just kind of out in the middle of the city. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it so happens that uh, be, because this is such a dense helicopter operating environment, there's actually some boxes on the edges of this chart uh, mm -hmm. that describe which frequencies helicopters should use. And so it just happens that LA is basically split in half, north and south. And there's a frequency for the south part of, I think it was 1 to 2.85. Uh, did I get that right? Yep. And then uh, mm -hmm. north, northern LA, the helicopters should use 1, 2, 3.025. And, and again, you'll have to go to our blog to kind of, we have some pictures of like where these boxes are, but right mm -hmm. on the chart, it, it kind of gives you that information. So, so if I'm flying in that area uh, and I, I want to be aware of helicopter traffic, I think 123.025 would be the most likely frequency that you would hear hear that chatter going on. 
but not easy to find. <laughs> Still, <laughs> no. it's kind of like we said, it's not so simple. So, right. Um, what about what is the what is like a second source? So I went to Sky Vector, but there's mm -hmm. also a very common website that's out there yep. as well. What what would be another good source, JQ, for us? Yeah. So there's kind of we kind of have a second second example here what Brent's getting at. So let's say you're mm -hmm. actually closer to an airport. You know, maybe. Mm -hmm within uh, two, three miles of an airport, um, then, then it's a little bit different. So actually you can look in at the chart, the airport will have frequencies associated with it, maybe a control tower or a CTAF. Mm -hmm. But what Brent's getting at is you can go to a website called airnav.com and you can search that airport and then mm -hmm. it will give you a whole list of frequencies. Uh, <laughs> so again, it gets a little confusing, <laughs> but there's kind of two main frequencies I think that you should be paying attention to, attention to and and that's uh, CTAF and, and control towers in Unicom. So what's the difference mm -hmm. between a Unicom and a CTAF brand? Yeah, so Unicom is like used for uh, to broadcast information just such as weather, uh, airport tenants communicate with aircraft, uh, whatnot. And then the CTAF is used for flight safety activities or air-to-air -air communications. Um, air traffic control, etc. So you have these two frequencies and certainly I, I'm kind of like going off on a tangent, but you know, what if Jakey, I'm having a hard time deciding which one to use, right? I'm just unsure. Um, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the radios have a scan feature. Yep. Um, so if I was unsure, I would actually just probably plug in both and just scan between the two. Uh, there isn't LA is going to be very, there's going to be a lot of talking going on. Um, you're going to find out very quickly which one you should be on just by listening. Is is the information that's going over the radio relevant to me? Um, and maybe this is a great segue actually into um, what happens if you've gone to both these sources, Air Nav, Sky Vector, you've looked at sectionals and you have all these frequencies, but you're still not sure what, what could you do the day before, Jakey, that would really actually boost the situational awareness yeah right so you know there's this concept of like site survey uh so maybe you just go out there the day before at roughly the same time period you'd fly mm -hmm. and just you know watch and listen so you can you know mess around with your radio try some different frequencies you can just watch maybe there's mm -hmm. a helicopter that always flies over at 10 o'clock you know or something like right. that on a route right. so yeah just go watch listen uh, kind of um, boost your awareness, like you said. And then additionally, right, if you're using other tools uh, other than radio, uh, you know, like AirMap has some aircraft indications. So if they happen to be reporting their position, uh, you will be able to see some aircraft. There's flight radar, you know, mm -hmm. it is it is delayed. However, uh, thankfully, aircraft tend to move somewhat uh helicopters not so much but they tend to move in like patterns right mm -hmm. so you can actually just gain the situational awareness um from other tools other than strictly just a radio mm -hmm. um and at the end of the day right we we still are required to see and avoid all unmanned aircraft so the radio doesn't give you the ability to tell a helicopter pilot that you're at 400 feet and they're coming inbound and tell them to get out of the way like that just is not how the rules are set up for us. Mm -hmm. um, so again, there are all these extra tools in the toolbox. Uh, they're not meant for you to like increase your risk because I could I could see you getting an additional sense of security, having this ability to maybe transmit or hear all the communications. You know, you shouldn't treat it like that. You need to be very careful when you're operating, you know, heavy air traffic areas. Mm -hmm. um, so. Not to mention handheld radios are kind of like uh, holding a microwave to your face, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Maybe this is our uh, occupational hazard warning of the day, right? So mm -hmm. there's actually a warning in these manuals that you have to hold them at least an inch from your face because that antenna is broadcasting like five watts of power. <laughs> so mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, beyond the whole aviation safety part, uh, you actually have to be careful broadcasting transmitting from those radios uh, mm -hmm. you know, holding that antenna right in your face right so right give right. yourself a sunburn <laughs> right kind of juicing up you could pop some popcorn i know there's been some myths about that but 
Um, so high level, let's just kind of, we covered, it took us a little bit of time to get into VHF, but like high level, like quick and quick and fast. Uh, what are like some three, like if you could summarize in three, you know, bullets, like what would you say about VHF radios? Ooh, boy, that's, <laughs> I'm putting that's you on the spot. True. Okay. Three bullets. So number one, FCC requires a ground station license. You can't actually legally broadcast with one. Mm-hmm. Number two, they are great for situational awareness. So you can try and monitor just where other aircraft are. Mm-hmm. And three, a combination of sky vector and air nav charts uh, and a little bit of site surveying should help you find the right frequency. But it is it is tricky. Mm-hmm. How is that? What are I your think that's three good. bullets? <laughs> you have a different uh, one? No, I mean, maybe slightly modified, but Go pretty much it. spot on for you. You know, like, number one, like, you know, it is a listening device, not a transmit device. So don't use it like that. Um, when in doubt, uh, I would just go and say, put all the frequencies in, buy a radio that you can scan multiple frequencies uh, and do that like that. It'll clear up confusion because it is, if you're not a manned aviator, it is very complicated. Um, it shouldn't be complicated, and a lot of people probably disagree, but coming from the non-traditional aviation background, I'm like, uh, you know, safe. I'd rather be safe than sorry. I'm putting all the frequencies in, tuning to the ones. You'll learn by just listening to uh, the chatter which station you should be on. Um, number three, <laughs> I think I'm just those two. That was two was like number three <laughs> as well. Um, maybe just a little tidbit to put in. So... I have used a radio at uh, on airport operations, and it is very nice to have a radio. I would recommend if you are operating near an airport to have a radio just because it gives you that situational awareness when planes are uh, coming inbound for landing and, and departing for um, after takeoff. So it really it's very clear where they're going. Like that is I think that's one thing um, I will say is that. The phraseology that the pilots use is consistent, and you will know exactly where people are leaving, what run, what runways they're departing from, uh, and exiting. So, yeah, yeah, good. No, I, li- I like that last one actually. Yeah, there are some places that it's a better mm-hmm. tool than than other places. So, right, right. Mm-hmm. Out here in the middle of a North Dakota field, uh, we have crop dusters, and you know, and that's where like the false sense of security, right? Oh, I have a radio; I can listen to chatter. Uh, the crop duster is not really going to be talking uh, yeah. about his position when he's dusting fields. Right. So you always will have to default back to see and avoid all unmanned or all manned aircraft at all times. And mm-hmm. this is, you know, doing a site survey, knowing that, you know, there are hazards present. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I awesome. think it's a good one. Yeah, um, that was a good one. And if there are any more questions about radio. Uh, I would say, Jakey, I'm going to put this on to you as the resident <laughs> expert in radio comms because uh, what is your background? Like, why, how do you know a little bit more about this subject? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm a man pilot, uh, CFI as well. So, I, I uh, kind of cut my teeth in aviation at University of North Dakota, both, mm-hmm. both my training and uh, training other students. So, yeah. Uh, nothing like some good old. VHF radio comms, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, so anyways, uh, if you guys have any questions, you know, f- certainly feel free to email us, info at 107waivers.com. And, you know, if we're getting the slump in the waiver totals, certainly would be helpful to answer a few questions for you guys. Yeah. All right. Until next week, right? <laughs> That's a good one, yeah. Take care. Fly safe.